You're joking, aren't you? It's the Teesside Chef. All back to mine for a palm or. I've got two Teesside legends for you here today, ladies and gentlemen. The world famous Middlesbrough palm or and Stanley Hollis, Middlesbrough born and bred and the only recipient of the Victoria Cross on D-Day. So let's get started with a recipe, and we'll box the history lesson off later, eh? First, we're going to need to make a bechamel sauce to top the palm oil. So you want 500 millilitres of milk first off. We're making enough bechamel sauce here for four large palm oils, but you can easily adjust the amounts depending on how many you want to make. And I'm adding a chopped medium onion to that classic recipe, this one. And then I'm putting a couple or three dried bay leaves in here. And then I'm going in with seven fresh peppercorns, full peppercorns. Don't overdo it with your peppercorns. And you want to make sure that your peppercorns are nice and fresh. And I'm going to add a half a teaspoon of salt to that. And then I'm going to give it a good stir up. And then I'm going to cook that very, very gently on a nice low heat and let all those flavours have a cheeky little mingle for a while. A good while, mind. And once it's had a good simmer, we can let it sit for a bit while we sort the rest out. So in another pan, get 75 grams of butter, and we want to melt that now, careful as. We don't want to brown it too much, and we defo don't want to burn it. So once that's melted, we go in with our flour, a tablespoon at a time. And each time, we want to mix that flour in properly until it's fully incorporated, and then go in with another tablespoon of flour. And keep doing that, and keep on going with it until you've got a nice, thick, dry ball. Stanley Hollis kept going on that fateful day. The 6th of June, 1944, D-Day. Hollis landed on that Normandy beach that day, a 31-year-old company sergeant major with the Green Howards. But as his company moved inland from the beaches, Hollis knew there was a rabbit away somewhere. Something wasn't right. Something had been missed. And it was then that he realised a pillbox containing enemy combatants had been passed by. Without a moment's hesitation, and with no regard for his own safety, Hollis, alone, stormed the pillbox. He fired his sten gun into the pillbox, and then when he ran out of bullets, he jumped on top, lashed a grenade inside, recharged his magazine, and continued firing on the enemy. Two enemy fighters were killed, and the rest were taken prisoner. Later that day, when two of his men were trapped in a house, sheltering from enemy fire, Hollis, sprinting through a hail of bullets, caused a diversion that allowed his men to scramble back to safety. Wherever the fighting was heaviest, he appeared. Wherever the danger was greatest, he appeared. And he saved the lives of many of his men that day. So now we've brought our butter and flour mixture together and I've wiped a tear away thinking about Stanley Hollis's gallantry. We're going to add our warm milk with all those flavours slowly to this mix. Add a bit at a time and stir. And when it's mixed in, repeat the process until all the milk is incorporated. If you get any lumps appearing, Get your whisk and crack on with that to get one homogenous mixture. Be careful with it at first, like, but as you crack on with it, it'll get a lot easier to mix it in, especially if you're using your whisk, you know? And I can only recommend really making your own bechamel sauce rather than buying ready-made one, because the ready-made ones, they just don't have that depth of flavour, you know what I mean? And you want your palm oil to be the best, don't you? Because, like, this is probably the greatest food invention of all time, this. And that looks like it's coming together nicely now. So once we've got all of our milk in there, pour it all into your sieve. Get rid of all the lumps and the bits of vegetables and the bay leaves and stuff in there. And give it a good stir up. And now you want to put that on the heat. And you want a medium high heat here. And you want to keep stirring it with your whisk. Don't let it catch on the bottom. Keep it moving. You've got to give it a good stir up. You're going to get a, a sore arm doing this, I promise you. But you've got to keep it moving. Don't stop. If you feel like you want to give in because you've got writer's cramp in your arm, just remember the heroic acts of Stanley Hollis on D-Day, and that'll give you the inspiration to crack on until the end, won't it? And as you keep stirring, that bechamel sauce will get thicker and thicker, and that looks like the right consistency to me. So let's get it off the heat now. Keep stirring it when it comes off the heat, though, because it will continue to cook, and you don't want it catching. And then we're going to put some cling film on top of it and press that cling film onto the top of it because we don't want a skin developing on top. And that's our bechamel boxed off, and we're going to let that cool down now, because it'll be easy to deal with later on. And we can crack on with our chicken now. I'm making a chicken palm oil here, so let's get our chicken in, and let's trim all the little bits of fat and knobbly bits and hard bits off it. 
And I find it easy to do this with a pair of scissors, but you can do it with a knife leg if you like to chew on a little bit more. And once we've got rid of all the grisly rat's bits, let's bring some bacon paper in and we're going to give our chicken a proper good hiding now. You can do this between two pieces of cling film if you like, but I'm using bacon paper here because our lass is always going on at me to save the ozones or trees or whales or wherever it is. And I'm putting a little bit of flour on each side of it so it doesn't stick to the bacon paper too much. And then another piece of bacon paper on top. And then I'm going to spark that chicken out until it's about a centimetre thick. Or however thick you want your palm or. It's up to you, innit? it? But I, I would say a centimetre is probably on the thick end, to be honest. And you can take some of your frustration at the world out on this now. With your rolling pin or something else that's heavy, like an anvil or something. I don't know. And I, that, Yeah, that looks pretty good there now. So let's get it off our paper and onto a plate. You might find that a little bit of the chicken might start to come away from the main part. But just push it all together and give it a good mash. And once you coat it, it'll all come together. Don't worry. And a few little raggedy bits might try and go unnoticed like those enemy fighters in that pillbox on D-Day. But just get a grip of them, eh? And give them a good mashing, just like Stanley Hollis did. And give those bits a good press down. And now we're ready to coat it. And you need more plates than a Greek wedding for this recipe, so just make sure that you're ready to do lots of washing up once you've done this. So here's our flour coming in, and you can also use cornstarch for this if you like. And I'm using two beaten eggs here, and that should be enough for four large parmos. And I like to season the chicken here instead of the flour, because you can change the amounts for different people, or you can keep a closer eye on how much is going on each one. So a good pinch of salt and pepper on each one. And because we've salted our bechamel well, we don't need to overdo the seasoning with the chicken. Now, a lot of parmos I've eaten in my time, don't seem to have enough salt for me. So I like to make sure that I'm well seasoned early doors. So season both sides of your chicken there. I mean, you can add other stuff here if you like. Sometimes I like to add a little bit of oregano, a bit of dried oregano if I'm feeling all fancy. So while we faff on with the logistics of having half a dozen plates everywhere and all this nonsense going on on the work surface, let's coat our chicken really well with this flour here. Press it in well and don't skimp here. And your flour helps your chicken stay nice and moist and gives your beaten egg something totally class to stick to. But we're not quite ready for that yet. Because first we've got to play musical chairs with all these plates on our work surface, haven't we? So let's get our breadcrumbs in and just tip a load on a separate plate and just leave them there on the side. And if you want to be a right hero like Stanley Hollis, you can put some crisps in your breadcrumbs and that's going to give your palm an absolutely nectar little crunch and crush them up. And I like to use these ready salted chip sticks here because they're dead dense and dead tasty. But you can use any crisps, I suppose, or cornflakes or something like that. So let's get them on top of our breadcrumbs and give it a good mix up. Try and evenly distribute the crisps in between the breadcrumbs there. And then we need to coat this palm oil in egg now. And make sure you cover it all. And there are no stones left unturned on this. Be like Stanley Hollis. If he'd left stones unturned on D-Day, we might all be speaking German now, according to my nana. So while you definitely can't compare wartime heroism with a bit of gentle cooking in the safety of your own home, do the job right is the watchword here. And flip it over a couple of times here and make sure you give it a really, really good coating. Don't be shy. Take your time. And then once it's got a good coating of egg, and that looks okay now, so we're ready to put it into our breadcrumb mixture. Just lay it on top. Be gentle with it at first. Flip it once or twice to make sure that you're getting a little bit of a coating each time before you start to press it down more firmly to get those breadcrumbs and those chip sticks to stick properly to it. And as you build it up, you can press it more firmly each time. And if you're a fan of a really thick coating, and you love putting weight on, you can dip it back in the egg again, and then coat it with your breadcrumb mixture again. That's going to be absolutely awesome. But it's going to be ridiculously calorific-like. Almost to an illegal level, to be honest. So keep flipping it and patting it down and then flipping it again and giving it a good press down again and then once we think we've absolutely nailed it we can put it on a separate plate and we're almost ready for the fryer here but I like to leave it now for about 20 minutes to let that coating dry out a little bit and then it'll firm up and crisp up a little bit better in the pan 
So once it's dried out a little bit, we're ready to fry it off now. So you want a preheated pan and make sure there's plenty of oil in it. Don't scrimp on the oil here. I mean, you can deep fry this if you want, but I think if you shallow fry it, you can keep more of an eye on it and you've probably got less of a chance of overcooking it. And this needs about three minutes per side in your preheated pan. And make sure you cook this chicken properly now. It needs to have an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Don't do what my mate Mally Meatball did. He'd been out one night, absolutely wrote off he was. Came home, rat assed, starving, couldn't be bothered cooking. So he ironed a piece of chicken, necked it, and spent the next two weeks in hospital with that campylobacteriosis. So now we flipped that there and it looks pretty good. Now I like to just knock down the heat a little bit now on the second side, just to avoid burning it or making it a lot darker than the first side. And once that side's had another three minutes, I'm going to flip it again and do a temperature check with my little thermometer here. I can recommend you get one of these if you're doing chicken a lot, just to make sure. And that's over 170, that, so that's fine. So let's get it out now. I've got a plate here with some kitchen paper on it and I'm just going to stick it on there. It'll drain off that excess fat. And there it is. That looks absolutely perfect to me. Like, this is going to be absolutely class, this. <laughs> so let's get our bechamel in now and that's going to go on top of there. So bring it in, take the cling film off, have a little taste test. And if you think it needs changing the seasoning, just give it a little bit more salt or whatever. Because I want you to be absolutely over the moon with this, like when you make it. I want you to be absolutely chuffed to bits with it, just like I am. I can't wait. And then we're ready to put our bechamel on top. So we can spread it on top, nice and thick. I mean, you can decide how thick you want it like. It's up to you. Just lay it on top there and then give it a spread around with a knife. And now that we've given our bechamel that chance to cool, it's a lot easier to deal with. If it's warm when you do this, it'll be running off the sides. It won't be nice and thick thick on top because it'll settle as it spreads out and I mean you know I don't like to go overboard with my bechamel but I like to know it's there you know what I mean and I'm doing a chorizo hot shop palm over here for this one so I'm bringing my cooked chorizo in and let's lay all that chorizo on top there if you want to put toppings on like something like chorizo or mushrooms you want to cook them very gently first just remember that any toppings that you do put on are not going to get fully cooked because this is only going to go under the grill now. So it's not going to cook fully anymore. Remember that when you put your toppings on. And I'm going to add some jalapenos to this chorizo hot shop palm oil. You don't need to cook your jalapenos. Like, obviously, nice big sprinkle of jalapenos there. I love jalapenos, me like I do me. And finally, give it a good covering of grated cheddar cheese. Don't use sliced cheese here because it won't melt properly. So if you've got a block, grate the block or use pre-grated cheese. And then we're going to grill that under a hot grill until that cheese is all melted on top and starting slightly to brown, but not too much. Don't let it brown too much. Keep an eye on it. It'll take a couple of minutes depending on how hot your grill is. I mean, I suppose you could do it in a hot oven as well for a few minutes, but it's got to be a really hot oven and make sure that you don't overdo it. Keep an eye on it. Are you listening? Keep an eye on it. And once it's done, it's going to look like that, hopefully. Oh, look at that. Oh. <laughs> it's palm on it. Oh. I mean, just, just look at it. Just, just look at it. I mean, it's, it, it tastes better than it looks as well. I mean, it's just unbelievable, this. Let's get it on a plate there. Eh? Oh. Look at the size of it. Hey, I bet Stanley Hollis could eat a full palm oil like this and still have room for a palm oil. Gives you an appetite save in your mates' lives, like. Not that I'd know anything about that, like. I'm a massive coward. And this is best with some winner's garlic sauce. Link in the description for that. A little bit of salad to keep the doctor happy. And, of course, you can't eat a palm oil without these epic triple-cooked chips. Link in the description for them. Eat this lot, and you'll be fit to take out an enemy pillar box single-handedly before running through a hail of bullets to save your mates from certain death. Probably. This one's for you, Stanley. Rest in peace, my mate. It's been emotional, lads and lasses. Come and see us again, eh? Anytime you like, when you've got a minute. And don't forget to like and subscribe. And until then, terror.